<laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everyone out there. Hi, my name is Jennifer, aka Grubflow, and I will be your host today, thankfully accompanied by an exceptional panel of women. Introducing them in no particular order, we've got Nidarina co-hosting with Sarah, Natasha, Orange Bag Lady, Corinne, and Ariella. Hi, guys. Everything's backwards. We're going to point at Ariella. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, big welcome to our Ecomi and VV fam watching and a special shout out to the community member who responded to our favorite Twitter feed and got the get, Biscuits. She's running all of our tech in the background. Um, and boy, did she ever get the get. Today we welcome father, husband, entrepreneur, executive, toy maker, and very serious man, Jeremy <laughs> Padauer. Or, or should we call you Uncle Jeremy? Because I don't know where that came from. I don't know how you feel about it. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I, I don't mind it. And it, it's a reflection that I'm too old to be cousin Jeremy now. So I, I guess I, <laughs> I can deal with it. it just, it's, a, it's, it's like having a bar mitzvah. Like it's a passage of time. It's like in, a mark in sand. But, uh, but whatever, I'm good with it. I'm good with it. And I'm just happy it's not you know, grandpa Jeremy yet. That's right. That's right. It will be at some point. <laughs> well, at the outset, on behalf of the women of VV, a group of women, Omi investors and VV fans, no affiliation. I thank you for sharing your morning with us. We're delighted to get to know you better. Um, I would say before we launch into Pokemon and everyone wants to hear about that and Omi <laughs> and VV and your connection with us, really? um, we'd like to get to know you a little bit. So, since we're talking about collectibles and toys, I think we have to go in the Wayback Machine for you. And if you would help us with your journey and tell us your story, I know as a kid you were a collective, you know, you collected. I don't know if you knew that you were collecting, but, you know, tell us what your favorite toys were and how you got started. Sure. Well, let's see. I am a, I'm a lifelong collector. Um, you know, my, my whole life I've been, I've been focused on, uh, the pursuit of collecting things and primarily things that have secondary market value. So when I was a little kid, uh, things like autographs and, and, uh, comic books and baseball cards and like all of those things were very interesting to me because, uh, I identified that. Uh, not only would they allow me to explore things that I found interesting, but also secondary market value allow you know, and I learned a lot about, you know, what something was worth and that scarcity created value. Mm -hmm. And I loved all of that stuff. So even at a young age, you, you knew that already that scarcity I, created value. You had that chip that you recognized. I, I did. And I did, but I also was the beneficiary of having a brother that's 13 years older than me. And my parents had him when they were teenagers and they had me when they were in their early thirties. And so by having, um, having had the experience of having a, uh, someone that much older who was already super interested in collectibles. You know, we'd go to flea markets together. I was four, he'd be 17 years old. And so I did get a lot of insight as to scarcity and value. And I did keep things that, you know, he would buy me with his, the money he'd make from uh, waiting tables. And he'd buy me like a little coin and it would be, it was just, it really just set off a bunch of, excitement for me. So yeah, it, it really set me down uh, a path my entire life uh, of, of being either a collector or, or a manufacturer. That's awesome. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Learning from a pro. Learning from a pro. <laughs> so. you find that, that still passes down through generations within your family as well, the collecting. I, you know, I, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet, but um, I have two girls, uh, 14 and 12, and I, my older one just joined the business club at her school. Uh, she goes to a public school here in LA uh, called Pally High, and my younger one um, seems to uh, like to watch TikTok. So I don't know how that uh, I don't know how that evolves into collectibles, but I, I'm going to do my best. <laughs> I'm going to do my best one way or the other. Were there um, any collectibles that you wish you had collected as a child or maybe something you had and threw it out? Um, I've, I've definitely got regrets about things I didn't buy earlier or um, wish I'd kept in storage. So, yeah, love to hear your opinion. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, 
the thing about being a being a collector is much like being like an investor in any equity. Um, you know, you tend to have all kinds of uh, regrets um, as markets evolve. So, you know, as a kid, I can look back and point to um, comic books that were you know, hundreds of dollars that are today, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, grading systems were not in place yet. So uh, one major thing that's happened in cards and comic books is that grading came into play, you know, maybe 20 years ago, 15 to 20 years ago. And it had further segmented the marketplace so much that you know, you used to go to a, a card show and you would buy a, a, a first ever issued card of a player and you would look at condition, but it wasn't the absolute reason why you would buy that card. Um, but today, like if you get something in a, P, a PSA 10, it could be worth a hundred times what a PSA one is worth. I mean, like I'll give you an example of something. So a 1952 Mickey Mantle with the rookie, Tops rookie, PSA 10, there's only three in the world in the top condition, today would sell for about $30 million, okay? 20 Amazing. years ago, 20 years ago, around 1999, one of the three sold for $250,000. And if you went back, if you went back another 15 years, call it to 1985, when I was 12, um, that same card would have probably cost five grand. So the the one thing that I try to express to people all the time is that there are things in our lives today that we might take for granted that the next generation of people would covet and find so remarkable that it could be generationally uh, important in terms of wealth creation. And uh, that's one of the things that I absolutely love about this entire marketplace. So the long-winded answer to your question is that there were plenty of misses along the way, uh, but I always keep myself fully aware and I always watch marketplaces evolve. And I think that we're seeing a lot of that evolution right now with things like OMI where, uh, and Vivi, where we see um, the early stages of a entire collectible system where there's built-in authenticity uh, because you know if it's on their system, it's real. There's no questioning whether it's real or fake. Like all the things that you see in the general open universe of NFTs and collectibles in general, like they have a great handle on. So it'll be very interesting to see how all of that evolves. Do you think as well that sort of evolution brings um, buyers and sellers together a little bit easier? or I'm not quite sure what it's been like in the past um, for buying and selling collectibles, but do you think it would be easier for somebody to find a collectible or or uh, contact somebody that, that has a collectible that they're after? So Absolutely. It's you know, an excellent question. You know, one, one thing that I would say about the, the universe of collectibles is that at the end of the day, it generally evolves in around a community. Um, back in the day, it was interesting because, you know, um, if you wanted to collect cards or something, you'd have to go to a card show, like a local card show. But you'd be around a bunch of people that have a similar interest. And while the transactions were not as easy to gauge in terms of value, meaning that you, if you went to one card show and then you went down the street to another, you might have different valuation systems in each. You know, one card that was $38 here might be $32 there because it was so fragmented. But the community was was clear. So what I would say the difference today is that the valuation is immediately accessible. You always know what the floor is. You can check it out. You can look at 600 items that are like it and understand what the floor is and what the transactions are occurring. Um, and the other thing is the community is engaging in real time. So the real time nature of the community and the real time nature of the grading systems and the transactional value where you can see like clear indicators of what something is worth. When you combine those things together, it really is very potent in terms of developing longevity within a collector system. 
Like the card market ultimately fell apart at one point in the 1990s. Of course, it came back massively today, but it fell apart because there was very few controls. Uh, there was very little grading, very little understanding. You couldn't watch a secondary market like eBay and sort by price and see what the heck is going on. You couldn't go into a marketplace like Omi has and see what was happening. And so for all of those reasons, what I would say is, yeah, absolutely. Like today we have a scenario with something like Omi, with something like Vivi. Uh, forgive me. I keep saying Omi because I, I probably check the price twice a, a week. Um, but the marketplace like Vivi, uh, where you have the immediacy and the understanding of both the community and the transactional value. So I really do feel like a system like that um, has all the makings for longevity and, and success from a collectible perspective. Do you, can I ask a question? Do you find also, because with something like with Vivi, you know, you can look at what you've collected, you can put them in photographs and, and play with them of sorts, right? But yes. in real life, if you've collected something, it loses value the more you look at it, right? So yes. kids that have played with their Pokemon cards, well, they've lost value because they're not sitting in plastic. So I, I wonder, you know, if collecting now because you're doing it through these collectibles and nfts if they'll be more valuable to us because we're not going to ruin them by interacting with them yeah so there's there's pros and cons okay i'll give you both and by the way if you hear barking in the background my dogs want to really eat the gardener and and i don't know what to say about it because they know the gardener we've had very direct interaction with the gardener but they still think the gardener is like a tuna fish sandwich. And so I don't know what to do about that. But we're just going to let them bark themselves to death. All right. To answer your question, um, which, if you don't mind, if you could just one more time ask me that question. Well, just do you find that collecting now is going to be almost better for a collector because you can't you're not going to devalue your NFT or your, oh, like, right. your VV collectible right. by Correct. interacting with it. Because you can interact with them, especially with yeah. VV, right? With the AR and everything. Yeah. So the double-edged sword. Okay. So back in the day, back in the back in the 80s and 90s, and uh, you didn't have you didn't have um, manufactured collectability. Everything was organic, meaning that if um, there were really very few limited edition type offerings. There was really like, you know, people would release sets of product and they would try to gauge consumer demand and they didn't really care too much whether they missed it or hit it. And it was all about that year and could they maximize sales and and that and those days affected collecting massively. And then over the course of time, and I've I was a very uh, uh, important part of this, especially on the toy and collectible side is we realized that we could manufacture collectability, meaning we could manufacture items that, that were well below the demand curve and would have longevity from a valuation standpoint. Yes, sometimes it's frustrating because you don't get necessarily get your hands on the super secret rare, but it's great for longevity. So I think collectors today, so two things, number one, having the opportunity to engage with your collectible is a very good thing. There's no question about it. It gives you utility where you wouldn't otherwise necessarily have utility. Looking at a digital image and saying, I've got this digital image, awesome, is not nearly as cool as saying, I have this digital image, which also acts as an avatar in a gaming simulation. Or I've got this digital image where I can also take it into my, uh, my digital universe and engage with it um, because that is my digital representation of me where, you know, and we're in that world now. I mean, we're sort of like, we're in that, that transitional matrix universe where our physical presence and our digital presence are starting to become at parity at par. And it's, and for some of us, uh, that's already occurred. And for others, you know, they don't even want to get on Facebook yet. Um, but but so the bottom line is the other interesting component of that is when you have manufactured collectability, um, you don't have to worry as much about grading systems. So I'm, I'll show you a card. So this is a 1999 Pokemon trainer deck card. OK, and what's interesting about this card is 
all the Pokemon cards that are in the marketplace from 1999 have blue backs, and this has a red back. And the reason why this has a red back is because it's a trainer deck card from that time, which was essentially the cards that were sent to uh, retail so that kids could experience the game and learn the game. They were never really meant to be in great condition. They were meant to be played, and there were only a few thousand of each card released, and it was as a promo item. So this has a grade of Gem Mint 10, okay? Because there's only seven of them in the world, okay? This is an organic collectible, okay? What I mean by mm -hmm. that is there was never meant to be seven of tens or anything like that. It just so happens to be that all the other ones got beat up and played hard. And it just so happens to be that there's a niche group of people like me who like really high-end, um, very rare things, okay? With that said, within the world of uh, Vivi, you see them creating, um, what's the best way to put it? In, the, in economics, there's something called the, the highest valued consumer principle, okay? Where it's like an upside down triangle, where the triangle represents the entire marketplace demand, but the very tip of the triangle represents what the, what the highest valued consumers are willing to pay for something. And when you can take a system and create 60,000 comic books and in a democratic way, throw those all out at the same price mm -hmm. and 500 of them are to satisfy this crew here, but it's given to this crew. It's, I think it's a beautiful thing. I think it's a beautiful way to manage things. It, 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 the, the playing field is even, I don't have any better shot than anybody else, but at the end of the day, they're creating trust. They're creating rarity and scarcity. And they're playing to the people who are willing to pay that kind of premium while giving that premium, almost like Robin Hood, to the people who don't necessarily otherwise fish in those waters. So for me, like being a feeling, loving capitalist, being both, uh, it's really satisfying to see them create a collectible system like that. So anyways, I've answered sort of a lot of questions with that one, but, and, and, and there's, I, actually, I would even like to say something else, if you don't mind, that's a little off the page. But back to this card, because I think a lot of people don't really understand digital collectibles yet. And you can talk about utility and you can talk about all those things. But at the end of the day, they want to go back to something that's a card and they want to say, but that's a physical object. And what I say to people who say that, and, and I hope that this explains the concept of goodwill, is that... When they manufactured this card, okay, this card cost five cents, one cent, two cents to manufacture. The utility of this card is 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 quite low. It's you can play a game with it, but you, it's not going to change your brakes. It's not going to fix your life. It's just a it's a piece of uh, of cardboard, okay. At the end of the day, but interestingly enough, in this card, within this card, what you have is a tremendous amount of emotional attachment to a brand and a tremendous amount of goodwill as a result. So the actual physical cost and value of this card may be two or three pennies, but the secondary market value of this card could be $10,000. You know, this one is probably around $10,000. So the goodwill is $9,999.98. The physical value is two cents. In this hand, I have a VV digital collectible or an NFT. The only difference between these two things from a physical valuation standpoint is two cents. And that's what people need to understand about NFTs or VV or digital assets versus physical assets is that no matter how, no matter what you might think about having the physical presence of any of the things that you see behind me, um, the material value of any of these things is not very high. And so everything in, is about goodwill when it comes to the collectible space as derived through traditional economic principles, supply and demand, and our love and trust for the platforms that we're dealing with. So thank you for allowing me to answer oh, that one. And yes, and look at that perfect timing. Mandy just posted the emotional connection with our digital collectibles with Vivi is real. Um, and I think that, you know, we were talking like beyond having capital and talent and all of those things, 
Vivi is selling emotions and it's capturing a feel, it feels like we're capturing lightning in a bottle. We all have memories of certain drops, that time we got the low mint, that time we got an ultra rare, where we were, um, we do it with our family. It, it, we huddle around the modem, my 15 year old walks through the house to show us where the Wi-Fi is best for a drop. Um, and then as a community, it is, um, you know, we all want, we all want to get a piece of the pie and there's plenty for everybody, but we genuinely are excited when our community members get something great with the drops. And, you know, especially with these comics, it really, you know, to add to what you said, it, it broadens the space, um, the opportunity for people who don't have a lot of money to get in. And it's like the corporations are, I don't know if they're doing it intentionally, but finally sharing a little bit. And it's a this symbiotic relationship where they can have one of the differences I think is this, this um, you know residual in perpetuity. You can give a yeah. license where in the real in real collectible space you pay the licensing fee, you pay you make you make the first purchase, and then the secondary market they're they're cut out and they don't get that. And so I think that what's really exciting here as well is we're opening the space to artists, cutting out the middlemen, to not just the big corporations. Um, with all due respect, we're not worried about Marvel making money. They're they're a powerhouse, but it's it's absolutely the right decision to give them those residuals and to welcome other people into the space. And you know, and another thing, because we're talking about the digital collectible space, and your world is very physical. This isn't about replacing. I don't see it replacing. I see it as an right. enhancement. And um, like shout out to Biscuits. We were talking about this the other day. She is one of the people in the community who has obtained NFTs and then searched them out or came across them in the real world. And now they're collecting the physical collectibles to take photos with their NFTs and to have both of those in the space. So, so, cool. so I'm kind of throwing a lot of things out there, but for me, I think that the digital and the physical world is going, they're going to help each other and there's going to be this symbiosis um, moving forward. Um, and then talking about the cards and the value who knows what's going to happen right now, right? We're, we're pre-crypto in VV. We're, we're waiting to open the doors to, you know, to Immutable. It's going to be the wild, wild west after that. But to see something where the good old days for us in VV was three weeks ago. Three weeks <laughs> ago, I could get a Marvel 1 for $2. I, could not, I didn't understand why people were selling them for 50 cents, 70 cents, a dollar. And then you look at what the floor is now. And you look at the secret rare. Um, you know, I've had a busy week. I haven't looked at the app, and then I open the app, and w what? Um, so you know, <laughs> there was an it, it is, you know, so you know the ROI for people who are getting in for six ninety nine, and I'm I'm like town crier. I'm going all over town because the digital collectible itself is not a hard sell, but the digital comic is such an easy sell yeah. because when you tell someone you can download this free app, throw throw 15 bucks and gems on it. So even if you can get two comics, yeah. it's $6.99 and they kind of look at me glazed over and I usually open the app and I go a little unfair. I do go to the Marvel one secret career and I say, well, maybe this will get your attention. And so I am like, I'm a grandma. I'm having all these kids and, and other people, you know, generation of out there of VV downloaders, you know? So, and <laughs> I, and I come back to the community, like look what I just got and went to the eye doctor last week. She's going to watch this and laugh. I went to the eye doctor and she's hooked and she got a secret rare yesterday. And how oh. exciting is that? And her first collectible was the um, Franken fat, which has the wonky eyes. So immediately she went to the office after pulling over on the side of the road on her way to the office to get it. She, <laughs> she put it in her, in her examination chair with the eye, you know, the, and it, <laughs> it was so much fun. So we're having fun and the emotion is there. The attachment is there. Um, and yeah, I, I do think that the folks coming into the VV side are trickling over to the physical collectible world too, which is pretty exciting. And Definitely. The community right? side, right? Collectors within this universe, uh, it's such a good community. When someone does get a secret rare, when they post it, everyone is so supportive and happy for them. It's not, oh, I didn't get one. It's like, yeah, it's good for you. And it's just, it's, it's exciting to see other people succeed. Well, listen, they had a choice. They had a choice to make. And the choice was to either uh, give away the value to the consumers uh, or the community, I should say, or to maximize the value and identify those who are willing to pay the most on the primary market. 
And I think when you're in a system where there where there is a secondary market where you can continue to chase valuation over time and you continue to get a royalty payback, that it incentivizes the large companies and the large corporations to act in a more democratic way about the way things are distributed. And so that's, again, that's one of the things I love about capitalism is that it's not necessarily a bad thing if the systems and the structures are there to support it in a way that allows for fairness on the first go around. And that's one of the things that is so awesome about, about cards as well, is that you sell packs of cards you don't know what's in it. It's a it's a lottery ticket every time. And that's one of the things that makes it so great. And I think that's the reason why everyone feels involved in a very meaningful way. The aspirational purchase is always there and it's always lofty. Like, am I really going to go spend $30 million on a 1952 Mickey Mantle PSA 10? No, no. And exactly. even if I had it, um, that would be risking my life in at home in many ways, right? <laughs> Uh, some explaining to do. Yeah, some serious explaining uh, to the divorce lawyer. That would be a lot of explaining. No. Um, but but the, the, the bigger picture here is that if there were 100 million packs of cards and one of them contained this $30 million card and everyone had an equal shot at it, that's kind of the world that, that on a magnitude, on a magnitudes larger scale, that's kind of what we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. Everyone and anyone can pull that secret rare. And they had a choice to make and they made a really, really great decision. And one thing I always tell people, um, whether they're creating a collectible system, whatever it is they're creating. So, you know, whether we're making Pokemon or whether we're making wrestling figures or whether we're making Halo or Roblox or whatever it may be, is that if you have something that's special, most of the time, put it in the mass produced item, even if it's a limited edition. So every 20 master cartons, replace one of the common items and put in this special item, give it to the consumer. Because when you do that, when you give it to the, when you give it to the consumer, you have a much better chance at creating a community of people who feel good about what you're doing. And yeah. so they, they made a really, really good choice. Really, really good choice. Hopefully, that that's the choice that continues. Okay. I think. I think. Go ahead, Dawson. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I was just gonna say. I think that's the whole brilliancy of VV and like the team is that they're making these collectibles accessible and affordable to the everyday person. You know, like, uh, not everyone is going to have enough money to get, you know, a PSA 10, um, let's say Pikachu <laughs> card, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, correct. but but they can get. Um, you know, uh, like a, they can put in fifty dollars, which is is a is is a nice chunk of change, but it's not all like it's not the end. You know, if you spend fifty dollars, and then um, just having adding adding that sentiment, let's say for the blind boxes, adding that. Um, okay, let's say for seven dollars, you can get the ultra rare, and you say, "Oh my God, this is amazing!" So yes, there are other people out there on the secondary market that will pay more than a hundred to get that ultra rare, right? And then you just add the the emotional attachment to it. Let's say it's the um, uh, the the we'll just talk about uh, what is it, the Captain America one? You know, people Captain American fans will really want that. So if they got it, they might not be willing to sell for 100, 200, 500, they might just want to keep that. So then that, right, right. that increases the the value of the ones that are out on the market. So it's just I it's just really brilliant because I think in the beginning I was worried that um that the team was going to see this they're, they're going to say, "Oh my god, like people are really paying $500 for this, $800." And I say, "Oh my god, they're not going to keep it for $7." But then if you look at the bigger picture, that's not what they want. They're not all about profits, you know. They're not about a thousand time profits. They they want to bring it to the everyday people. You know they want um uh, um what is it a mass adoption and and I think that's just the most brilliant way to go about it because you're making it affordable. You're giving you know like you said uh, more power to the to the collectors and there's just there's just no there's just no stopping it. <laughs> Definitely. If I could just add on to the to the back of of what both of you guys have said about Jeremy the and the way that your company has kind of uh, approached the idea of collecting and you've kind of democratized it, you've sort of made it, like like Danson said, much more um, affordable and much more approachable. I think that there's like this air of, of collecting. Like I, I always think back to David, 
David's our David Young's uh, museum that he has in his house. You know, it's it's full of pieces that are just like you know, it, only in our wildest dreams. I, well, for me anyway, like owning something like that would be so, just so far away. You know, um, but something having something like Vivi, like a platform that really focuses on the democratization, letting everybody have that chance, that initial chance. Um, and with that, like I, I have never collected comic books in my life. And I think with that, taking away that barrier, you've opened up this whole, just and like for even like I talk about artists all, all the flipping time, but like there's a lot of us that have never, like I'd never been exposed to a lot of the artists that we now have on BB and as well as the, the comic book artists and uh, all of the sculptors and, and everything. So not only has it allowed us to kind of get our own collections going, but it's expanded our, you know, perception of collecting and just in general, just to see the the products and the, and the creations that are out there. Um, yeah, Vivi's done a really, really freaking good job of bringing that down to like sort of more ground level, I think. Totally. Yeah. And expanding and expanding the potential marketplace of included people. Essentially, mm -hmm. like I, I love what you just said because I, I mean I can certainly relate to the concept of not necessarily being able to participate at the absolute highest levels of a collection. Well, mm. you know, I, I grew up in Mississippi and Tennessee and places like that, um, and and it was a an experience where it's not like my neighbors were also participating in that. They were. I mean, but. But to know that you can have a chance, to know that you're part of a community where everybody comes in and has the same shot at things, I think it's a very powerful, powerful it's statement. Huge. It's, huge. it's huge. And guess what? They'll be, uh, again, the capitalistic part of it takes care of itself because the company and the licensors will benefit from the secondary market sales. So it's, and by the way, and everyone's happy to see it too. You know, when Harley Quinn sells for a lot of money uh, because it's a very sought after particular uh, particular collectible on Vivi, um, people who have never gotten a secret rare yet don't go like, "Ugh, I hate it when that happens. They go, that's so cool because that's all part of the built in system and the beautiful economics of it that that benefit, you know, ev everyone. But because and the include, by the way, the art component that you mentioned, like the idea that okay, now you understand a certain art style. So now you start to investigate more that particular art style and the other artists that may play in that style. It's really, really, it's really cool. I, I absolutely love that stuff. And, uh, you know, artists um, and musicians mm. have for eternity been taken advantage of by business people. Amen. And uh, this really does help uh, level that playing field a little bit, a little bit. I, I think um, one of the reasons why I, I was brought, I, I kind of found Omi at the same time that I found another investment that I was getting into. And it was such a turn on to hear about the idea of fractionalized interests, being able to own a portion of something. Um, and the example that was posed at that time was, for instance, whoever the London house is that owns Taylor Swift's catalog. People yeah. can then own like a fractionalized interest of Taylor Swift's catalog. And if, if they are fans of hers, they are also investors. And now they own something. So it feeds into all the emotion and then the investor. And now Taylor Swift, instead of having the record companies be beholden to them, she's beholden to her fans. And now she's got this free marketing and she's got this fan base around the world of people who are organically already love her and want her to succeed. And so that was something that brought this, this whole marketplace to, um, to me. And so I wanted to ask you, for me, I, I bought into Omi back in March. That's when I found the project and I downloaded VV and I looked and um, I, I regrettably watched a lot of the drops go by as I was shoveling money into Omi. And um, I just thought, I understand the collector space. That's not who I am. And then some lovely, wonderful community member dumped an NFT into my account for free as a gift over the summer. And it was it. I was in my office. I got an Ecto-1. And I put it there. I have interns working for me and I had them run over to let's take a picture with this car. It was it. I was sold. And um, <laughs> I haven't, you know, I, I 
the kids laugh like we're going to eat top ramen this week because we need money for the drops and um <laughs> maybe not literally but that's what we talk about and um you have said quite publicly several times that when the team came to you a couple of years ago with this pitch, you weren't completely sold on it. And um, it seems like you've changed your mind. And I would like to know what what was more um, appealing to you and how much our community has, has made a difference. Because I do know that you're an advisor on another NFT project. I'm also, full disclosure, I'm an investor there too. But I feel like the community is non-existent there. I don't have any... Um, so while I have that bag sitting there and I almost want to just move it over to Omi because this is where I spend my time and my energy, uh, I just would like to know what changed your mind, what factors came into play, and in kind of what capacity are you hanging with Vivi and Omi team? Yeah. So, okay. So I'll deconstruct that. Um, so I met, um, uh, I met David and Dan a few years ago, maybe maybe a couple, two and a half years ago, three years ago with Al Khan. And Al and I have been friends for a long time. Um, um, Al and I have had very similar careers. Um, he, he did it earlier than me. But, you know, that's sort of the handoff, the natural handoff of everything in life. There's always going to be someone who does it before you. There's always going to be someone who does it after you. And, uh, you know, hopefully it's a it's a broad group of people that you can uh that you can hand off to and from um in the in in the situation with al he was always like a um a, you know an aspirational person from from where i stood because um that guy just never he never stops i mean he he has a tremendous eye a tremendous vision um but uh no matter how good your, good your eye is no matter how good your vision is um, when you are in the business that that I'm in, when you're in the business that he is in, you tend to fail a lot. And depending on the timing of your failures, um, you can feel like quite a failure. Um, so if the first 15 things that you try fail, um, you might see yourself in one way. But if the first thing you try succeeds, the next 14 <laughs> things fail, you might see yourself as a success. You know, the irony of success and failure has everything to do with timing. So I guess in, in the eyes of the world, Al's a great success and I'm a great success. Um, but it, in, when you're living in my head, what you recognize is it was a lot of trial and error. And there was a lot of times where the, the error almost, you know, knocked you completely out of the game. And that it, in the end, timing was a major player, but also hard work was everything along the entire way. So I preface the answer by saying that mm -hmm. because when Al came to me with this, I thought it was nuts. I, I was, I, I sat there and he came in with, and by the way, please note that, you know, if I see a hundred things professionally, there may be two of them that I think are viable. If I see a hundred things personally, there may be three or four that I think are viable to take a shot at. Um, this did not fall into that category at all. Um, there, you know, the crypto space evolved a lot over a few years. Um, and talking about the concept of utility around a digital asset attached to the blockchain um, was an extension of something that I didn't have a tremendous amount of trust or knowledge of anyway. Um, the fact that all of these big licensors were supposedly joining in was another big barrier to entry. Like, okay, well, it's one thing to say that Marvel is interested. It's another thing to say that Marvel's in. Um, and there was nothing to compare this to. Mm -hmm. So you know, one thing that I do when I'm evaluating opportunities is that it's almost like watching a movie. You know, you can be like, well, this reminds me of the Hunger Games and that's why it's good, you know, and uh, in, in the toy business, it's all about play patterns. It's all about themes. You could say, wow, I can see how this would be viable for a three to six year old because it's nurturing play or it's the play pattern is uh, conflict in nature. And that appeals to a bunch of kids um, or the themes are dinosaurs or princesses. And that appeals to a bunch of kids. And there are things that you do. There's logical steps that you take as you're weeding out and evaluating things. So Vivi didn't really fit into a structure that I fully understood, nor did it 
that into something that I thought was going to be necessarily entirely viable to put together. But because it was Al and because uh, I, you know, Dan and, 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 and David made a big impression on me as, you know, people who clearly were trying things, um, whatever the result was going to be, I, I really personally value people that are trying stuff, you know? So I stayed aware and I, you know, Al and I talk all the time and, 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 you know, I would ask him questions and I would hear that things are progressing. And so there's a tipping point in everything. I imagine that there's relationships that you've had in the past where there's a tipping point where the other person didn't really seem all that interesting. And all of a sudden they're extremely interesting um, or, you know, whatever it may be, business and life have a lot of similarities, right? There are business opportunities that don't seem at all interesting. And all of a sudden it's like, oh man, because certain indicators are there. So that's what happened with me and uh, and and Vivi. There was a lot of credible people. Um, I saw them getting traction. Um, I started understanding the value of blockchain, uh, and then and then slowly but surely, I was like, you know what? I I got to get in on this. You know, like like I got to get in on this. So I did. I got in really early on uh, on Omi, and um, I just really feel like, you know, this is not investment advice that I'm providing by any stretch of the imagination, nor is it directional. I'm not saying go out and take any unusual risks, but as part of any portfolio, diversification is important. Whether you're talking about collectibles, whether you're talking about traditional investments, whether you're talking about how much time you're spending with any individual friend, you know, diversification is a good thing. You know, if you've got 20 friends that you consider to be good friends. If one decides that you're no longer interesting, it's good to have 19 friends. You know, if you've got 20 investments uh, and one sucks, it's good that you got the other 19. And, and so this one to me seemed like a really good idea to be part of a diversified portfolio of investments. And I just think that there's a lot of reasons why it has potentially significantly huge upside. Um, you know, they were early to market. They were early to these relationships. They're executing exceptionally well. They're proving to the uh, community of collectors that they are executing well. Um, there's value to the secondary market. Um, they There's a scenario where, you know, you're dealing, we we're talking about utility before. Um, there's limited utility to this, but when you have a digital asset, you can really take that digital asset into all kinds of different worlds that maybe we haven't fathomed yet. They've started showing their hand there a little bit in terms of what those worlds might look like. That's really interesting. Um, the tokenomics of OMI are interesting to me. The fact that that even though there's not a necessarily an immediate utility yet in terms of the token, there is some limited. But the burning aspect of it, as they're building up this giant community and, and game plan on Vivi, is very, very interesting to me. I'm willing to ride that for a long, long time to see where it, where it lands. And then, and then you know, finally, um, when you look at um, when you look at the reach, a lot of ninety nine point nine percent of the reach has been organic, because com people are communicating with each other on a one to one basis. You know, the truth is when you're um, evaluating a business opportunity and when you're um, trying to determine where to put your money, um, when you see something that's building organically, it tends to be a lot more profitable and a lot more powerful than something that's forced, right? Like anything else in life, if it happens organically, it tends to be better. It tends to be better in every single way. Um, and this community has had very little marketing investment put into it. Like it's not because they don't care. It's because infrastructure wise, when you go from zero to a hundred that fast, the idea of in investing capital in growth is uh, probably working against your own best interests. So I think of this world in terms of, okay, while three years ago, I didn't see it. Now I see it very clearly. And I saw it fairly clearly about a year ago. And I really have a decent vision for where I think that they're going to be going. And I just think that you're going to have a situation where um, 
it's going to be um, uh, a, 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 a broad experience with uh, tremendous utility. So that's, that's not, again, that's not investment advice. Um, Oh, thank you. No, thank you for that. And I wasn't suggesting like, oh, why didn't you see the the benefits of Ecomi two years ago? But just more interested in in what the um you know what the journey was for you to see it because I yeah. am seeing that organic growth. I'm seeing, and I, I, I to me, it's been like watching a masterclass, watching the foundation yeah. be poured for this for this company. The way that Dan and Dave and the whole team, how they run with integrity how they're transparent, how much time they spend with the community. The AMAs have been fantastic. Um, the way that they play with the community is super fun with the teasing. And then they watch the community put on their foil hats and we come up yeah. with all of our conspiracy theories of what's coming. It <laughs> is mutually satisfying. As fun as it has to be for them, it's wildly fun for all of us. And it's it really yeah. is an all good fun and that you can have an investment that can be this fun. So in our house, you know, we do you know diversify, no financial advice. I get it. That's the right way to go. But we joke about, okay, now I think we're, are we diversifying by being an Omi and Vivi? Oi. So like, <laughs> so no risk it, no biscuit. That's, that's where we are. That's, that's our, our household theme. Um, so I, I mean, appreciate that. As long, what, as long, guys, as long as it's a situation where no matter what it is that you're investing in, um, if, if you wouldn't necessarily make the recommendation to somebody else, um, you, 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 it's always a good gauge. I always ask myself, at what I'm doing right now, would I tell somebody who even has a huge tolerance for risk, would I recommend this to somebody else? And if the answer is no, then usually it's a good indicator. And but in, in this particular case, like honestly, the drops are not expensive, and and Omi to buy in is pretty inexpensive. It's in and of itself, so it's not necessarily so you don't have to go all at one time make a big you know purchase to be that's why it's it. so easy right it's so yeah. easy to i'm not saying force but you know push, i feel almost like a moral obligation to tell those around me who i love and i come into contact with oh my gosh for seven bucks you have a chance to flip it it could be worth thousands of dollars next month and you know what it's not really a big risk that seven dollar buy-in um and i appreciate that it Maybe somebody can't participate in all of the drops, but it being such a low retail price, it does make it easier to bring it to people and show them, um, hey, and then lead a horse to water and give them, I give them the information. We've got great community providers. I share Crypto Far West's fun WTF VV part two. And I start with people, I start people there. This is fun and it's educational. If you're interested after this, then I introduce them to TAPS. And here's TAPS sitting down explaining the tokenomics. What is OMI? There's a lot of VV users who don't even know that there's a token. They don't even understand that it's crypto, which I think yep. is going to be remarkably interesting to watch how OMI floats with the market. Of course, it's going to go with the market, but there's this really interesting aspect I see that I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, obviously, it's not sustainable the way that things are pumping right now. There's going to be a you know capitulation, but I don't think it's going to be a crash. That's my gut. And you've all and you know what you've said before too is you can be so so sure of something and so emotionally attached to something, but what is that reality? So right. I you know I feels real, and every time I doubt, every time I'm thinking, you know, are we risking you know making the risk it? Um, I'm driving that? home the other day and I'm thinking, okay, do we have enough? Are we doing too much? Should we, should we diversify more? And then I get the post that we've got MGM and we've got 007 coming and not more, more than that. It's the first confirmation of a, an announcement where Vivi is making a drop in collaboration with a movie coming out. We've all suspected that was coming, but here it is. And everything's rapidly, it's it's moving so quickly. It's like taking a sip from a fire hose. And that's yeah. why I think that the community spirit and our, we're so bullish on Omi and we're so bullish on Vivi that, um, you know, I, I think we're onto something. It feels, it feels real. Well, I, think that, I think cycles will work within digital collectibles. So we know there's cycles with physical collectibles. We know there's crypto cycles. How do you think that will come together in the digital digital collectible world? Well, I think I think one thing about cycles is that there's generally a catalyst for why something cycles. Um, mm -hmm. Like 
like I said, the card market tanked because there was very little regard to the supply demand curve. There was a tremendous amount of cons the manufacturers were trying to maximize profit um, and it blew up. Um, while, you know, our broader economy, at least in, in the US, is on a unprecedented 20 year positive cycle or 15 year positive cycle. Um, everything generally has a catalyst. So I don't know what will be the catalyst for there to be a downturn or for there to be an upturn. Well, certainly, you know, look, OMI, the, o, OMI, the tokenomics and the token um, had an immediate spike and then had a crash, okay? Right. And I think that the crash in my mind was heavily due to the fact that it was just so far ahead of VV and everything else. Um, in my opinion, where it is today feels like it's quite far behind. That's just an opinion. But where it felt super ahead, now it feels almost that far behind it. And you see the tokenomics, the amount of burning. Um, so I just, I don't know what the catalyst will be. Um, but humans are fallible and we do things wrong occasionally. But I do think that the team at VV has shown a real high regard for the community, for listening to the community, and for and for and for reacting and for also being proactive about new opportunities. In in fact, I personally believe that some of the biggest things that will happen in um, the world of VV and for the ultimately the OMI token are things that are technologies that are that are early stage today. And the application of existing digital assets to those technologies. So obviously, I know that we're all talking about the concept of uh, digital property versus physical property, and the and and showing things off. But what are the extensions of that? You know, I would love to be able to see what the future technologies bring. But it's clear to me that they'll be digital. And while it's difficult to scale things around this. It's not as difficult to scale things around a digital experience. So um, the cycles will occur um, and the reaction and the strength of the underlying collectible platform will greatly mute what those cycles downsides look like. I, I will say one more thing, and that is being a closed universe right now has been of great benefit to VV. And I know there's a lot of interest in, well, let's, you know, like open up that forbidden door and let's have stuff tradable on open sea and everything else. And there's excitement around that. And obviously though there's positives, but certainly one of the things that, that we all have right now is certainty. We know that these collectibles are real. They're minted within the a closed universe. Um, it's part of a community that's identifiable and uh, growing very rapidly, and honestly, the oh, the broader NFT space has a lot of challenges with counterfeiting, and mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of shelling that happens out there. There's a lot of things that you look at and go like, mm, I don't know. So this, you know, the way things are right now in terms of that are are you know are quite good, um, but I'm sure that they'll be taking. Uh, uh, certain precautions to make sure that their that their viability remains uh, within their platform. Definitely. Uh, ju ju just to add something. Sorry, Ariel, go ahead, bud. No, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just to add to the to the open sea um, uh, debate and the idea of of VV and open sea kind of becoming. Uh, interoperable between each other. I think there's going to be a level of that with Immutable and them being on the same uh, marketplace. Uh, I don't know the details, but check it out. But um, I, I was watching a, a, a document or a, like a documentary, I think it was Gary Vee, and he was saying, he said something that really stuck out to me. And this is not a confirmation on Disney or anything, just, just to put that out there before I say what I'm going to say. <laughs> but <laughs> But he, um, Gary just described um, like things like IPs uh, and Walt Disney and Walt Disney like made that sketch of, of this character and then built this world around it. That was like 90 years ago or something, like nearly 100 years ago. And the guys on OpenSea are trying to do that from scratch. I feel like they're trying to build these characters 
um, these IPs and then build a brand gradually surrounding that. Whereas Vivi, we've already got that down. We don't need to like the, those that that extra layer of um, like the nostalgia and the memories and that the creative the IP has just had so much time to kind of mature. We don't need to kind of consider the same things as OpenSea and the guys that are over there. They're trying to do a Walt Disney. You know, they're trying to establish these this this brand. Um, whereas Vivi uh, and uh, the conversation about OpenSea and Vivi is always a difficult one for me because they're just such different animals. You know, they're just such different um, ecosystems. Um, and yeah, I think they'll eventually, you know, come together. But we we're dealing with um centralized media and you know already established cartoons and, and figures and characters and storylines in a centralized way but we have the back end obviously of the, the crypto and everything but but open sea is like a its own decentralized media almost in in that kind of way so that's gonna you know that's definitely they're gonna have different challenges i feel well i'll, yeah. tell, you, I'll tell you this one one thing and and um about um, you know, in, in the world of physical product that I live in, the, the analogy that I would draw is that uh, VV is catering to the masses um, with brands that are already appealing to the masses. Um, there's a very small fragment of the masses that are aware of VV mm -hmm. and a very small fragment of a fragment that are aware of OMI, mm -hmm. but they haven't turned on their like marketing campaign yet. To, to, to establish that awareness. Well, things like Board Ape Yacht Club and, and, and the things where there's enormous valuation is a little bit, is a lot more specialty. Uh, if you think about it, um, and by the way, that's not a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Louis Vuitton is a specialty brand. You don't find it at Target. Um, does it mean it's good or bad? No, there's no value judgment. It just is what it is. And I think that it's a it's two different strategies. Both are viable. But from a scale standpoint, um, when you're appealing to the masses and you're doing it in a way that is democratic and it is uh, trustworthy, you can build something ginormous. And again, they've had such a head start um, usually in a situation like this, you have three or four players that you can identify where they've carved it up and this one has this and this one has this and this one has this. And it's, it's not exactly like that here. They, they built in an enormous brand base. So over the course of time, of course, there will be other players that are appealing to masses in, instead of specialty oriented items or one-off items. But that head start is going to pay very big dividends for these, for, for this organization. So if I would just want to chime in, because I have some notes here, so we yes. before too off track, I'm like, I need to get caught up. I, one of the things that I love about just Vivi and the whole NFT space in general is the audience that has been captured. You know, like I myself, I'm in my mid thirties. And so for me, you know, I'm not into playing with the little figurines and collectible items like my seven year old is, you know? And so when I was introduced to Vivi, um, I found Vivi on my actual birthday, which was in March. Um, that's my Vivi birthday too, is my physical birthday. Um, you know, it captured me because now I'm able to interact, you know, be involved with the community, you know, and now I'm saying, Hey kids, you know, I'll be at a birthday party. Who's your favorite superhero? You like Batman? You like Spider-Man? You like what? Here, let's go over here. Let's get a picture together. And, you know, I'm printing them up for all the kids and they're absolutely loving it. But for a way that we can just, you know, things have changed, you know, in the world. And, you know, I know, you know, it's, it's not as safe as it used to be, you know, when I was five and six years old, where I could just go out and ride my bike and, and play different games and maybe Pokemon or marbles or some of these other things that you could do where now, it's allowing children to engage with um, other children again. You know, it may not be out on the streets riding bikes. It might be virtually or whatnot, but using your imagination. And then, like I said, catering to a much broader um, an audience. And then, um, so one of the questions that I had for you, Uncle Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but with the whole, you know, we have our hard copy collectibles versus NFTs. So, 
I know in some of your previous videos, you've talked about like the grading skills and some grading skills matter to you, but some don't. What would you compare? Like, obviously with NFTs, we don't have a grading scale figured out yet. I know they talk yeah. a little bit about with the comics that they might deteriorate, wear and tear. The more you read them, they might go down. But overall, there's there's not really much of a grading scale. Or would you say that the mint numbers now would be what a grading scale is? 100%. I think you nailed it. Um, you know, when you have a system, you look for scarcity, right? And scarcity is achieved through uh, the supply and demand of the underlying asset, or it can be uh, achieved through the, the underlying asset being stratified into a grading system. Um, when you have a scenario like, um, like they have, they know that grading isn't and and artificially like creating like a grading thing where hey i got a, a nine. Oh, i got a 10 like i don't know that just seems a little disingenuous i'm not i'm not sure that i would be like super psyched about that but providing different covers uh that's really that's really interesting and and providing a different experience through that where you can visually see it not to say that they can't figure out the grading thing one day. Maybe there is a way to say this is an uncracked book that's never been looked at. But I actually think that um, one of the beautiful things about the digital experience is that, you know, we who find these assets being so viable from an investment standpoint get to engage with them and interact with them and uh, without screwing it up. So yeah. doing it with scarcity, I think, um, is a is a great way of doing it. OK, because I know a lot of people were saying, you know, with the comics, you know, a couple of them had 60,000 mints and they're saying, oh, my gosh, all these mints. But if you think about it, I mean, what would you say as for like the Pokemon cards? Like what is an average, um, you know, a box or like a set, you know, because you, you figure, you know, hard copy wise, somebody physically has to go to that store, you have to buy it in person, whereas virtually anybody in the world has access to these collectibles. So would you say that 60,000 editions, even though that's the highest we've had, is still a fairly low and scarce number can, compared to the population in the world? Uh, it, it all depends, okay? It depends on what the consumer base is doing because the consumers will tell you everything. So when something sells out in 40 seconds <laughs> and you have 60,000 units of it, um, it's not about the units as much as it's about a function of units over time. Okay. So, or is it time over units? I don't know. I'd have to think about that for a second. But whatever the function is, there is a math function that would be very clearly identifiable in terms of um, the 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 potential demand versus the available assets. In this particular case, sixty thousand. When you just hear a word sixty thousand, seems like a lot. But if if there's a demand for six hundred thousand, then you're satisfying ten percent of the demand. And when you're satisfying ten percent of the demand, by the way, I made up. That's an arbitrary number. The six. <laughs> but, but if you're fulfilling ten percent of the demand. Um, then you probably are creating something that has a secondary market value that's significantly higher than the underlying first offering, um, okay. regardless of which one it is. All right. So last two questions. So would you say a first appearance common yeah. or an ultra rare secret rare non first appearance would have the most like, oof, I think so I, appearance yeah. common, or, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 that. <laughs> no, I, I see where you're going with that. Um, I think that in a situation like this, that scarcity is is often going to be the great indicator of valuation. Um, the demand for a first edition common of a critical asset like you know, uh, Spider-Man's first appearance or whatever it may be, will we'll have significantly higher demand than a regular common book within a non-critical 
superheroes, you know, universe. But if if that has a hundred issues and this has sixty thousand, and it's both within the Marvel universe, um, I would personally go after the hundred issues if if they were both the same value. Um, if one was 48,000 units and one was 60,000 units and the 48,000 units was celebrating a secondary character and not their first appearance, I'd go after the 60,000 unit first appearance. Um, in this particular world that we're in, you can immediately understand the way the secondary market reacts to something and you can track it over time. So all of those questions are answered in a really uh, potent way. Um, in, 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 and I will say like, you know, back, back in my day, back, back in the, in the olden days, um, there was a lot of discovery that went along with that. Like you really had to take a lot of time and effort to determine these answers. And today they're almost immediate again, whether you're dealing with eBay or whether you're dealing with open sea or whether you're dealing with a marketplace on VV, um, or whether you're looking at worth point, um, which is a subscription service for collectibles or whatever it may be that you're looking at, those indicators are immediately there. And so I hope that answers that question. Yes, thank you. So then just the last one and I'm done. So in one of your videos, you compared Star Trek <laughs> to Pokemon in the digital, in the, in the hard copy, like digital world, right? So would you say, hypothetically speaking, that if, about that. you know, Pokemon to- I think you mean Star Wars. Star Wars, you, sorry, Star Wars, Star Wars, oh, oh, okay. Star Wars. Yeah. Star Wars, Star Wars. <laughs> okay. You know, the, uh, would you say that Vivi Ecomi would be the Pokemon to the NFT space that Pokemon was to Star Wars in the digital? I mean, I think, I think Ecomi is a platform. Um, and so as a platform, the, the, the platform is only as good as it is trustworthy and it's only as good as it is uh, their strategy to bringing product to the marketplace. So um, platforms tend to be bigger than brands um, if you do it right. Like Amazon is a platform for selling product. Um, and, you know, Amazon as a valuable platform has made the wealthiest couple in the world. Now they're not together anymore, but individually they're still damn wealthy <laughs> and uh but but nothing that's sold on the amazon platform in and of itself is worth as much as the amazon platform so um i don't i don't know if i'd compare a platform to a brand but what i will say is the platform is proving itself to be very trustworthy and big brands are attracted to trustworthiness and and that might be uh you know star wars to pokemon that's an interesting comparison um there's a lot of stuff we're doing uh, on, on physical product um, that we haven't announced yet at, at the company that, that I am a partner at. Um, uh, of course, you know that we're the global partner for Pokemon. Um, it, would be, it would be more so like the, the open sea and the JPEGs and those are more like the Star Wars and then the VV NFTs <laughs> are like the Pokemon. So, you know, hard copy space versus digital <laughs> spaces. I hear you, I hear you. I'm. <laughs> Listen, I don't, the thing is, I would need more of a dissertation to understand that. Like, I hear what you're saying, and I think that there's a lot of interesting concepts on that. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, so, oh, like, it, like two platforms that have similarities would be like uh, the environment at VV versus the environment at OpenSea, Okay. But the similarities sort of end because OpenSea is a decentralized environment where anybody can print anything and trust becomes extremely concerning. Uh, and it's the reason why they're doing authentication now there and saying like, this is one that you can guarantee is what it is. Whereas VV today is a closed universe of trusted brands and brands that they're bringing onto their platform. So, I just think that it's it's two groups taking two different approaches to the way they're distributing content and the content being brands or opportunities uh, of, of brands. Awesome. Thank you. Um, before we wrap up, we're going to do a quiz, but I, I can't help myself. I have a couple of things that came up while you guys were discussing and um, briefly 
Corinne, thank you for bringing up taking pictures at parties with the kids. Um, I think that as women, we have a different perspective and we're coming across unintended positive consequences of Vivi and the app. I know in my household with teenage boys, you can't just ask a kid what's going on in school. Is there drama? Do you like a girl? Do you like a boy? What's going on? What's going on with you? They don't really respond to rapid fire questions. Um, we, when we're doing an activity, whether it's puzzling or we're at the beach or we're hiking, you just have the organic conversations come. And Vivi has been tremendous in that regard. Um, there's another uh, relatively famous member of our community, Claire, and she works with children in, a, in, in family law court, which is hard enough. And to gain their trust, she has learned to use the Vivi app so that she's no longer the monster that, that sometimes kids are, you know, reduce social workers to, given the unfortunate circumstances in their household. She's been using Vivi to connect with children in that capacity. We've talked about, wouldn't it be cool if children's hospitals maybe had um, a few iPads that they could, you know, let the children who are stuck there with cancer treatment use those iPads and invite their Vivi friends into their room and, and plop them in AR and take pictures of them. Oh, There's all these different unintended consequences that moms and, and women, because we're not all mothers, um, have that perspective. So I just wanted to add that from Corinne. And then back to the, um, the grading, there's talk in the community that after you read one of these comic books, for instance, there's a little green check mark. And does that reduce the value of your comic? Because now you've read it. So that's number one. And then also in the collectible space, I'm wondering if... Um, if you think that provenance is going to come into play. So the secondary market's great, but if you can prove on the blockchain that you are the original owner of it on a drop, will that maybe come into play in valuation in the future? I mean, I think, I think provenance is always important, um, but it's less important in a universe that is a closed universe than it is in an open universe. Um, so in a world like a, uh, you know, when things are unleashed outside of the VV platform, um, seeing that provenance and seeing exactly that it came from a trusted source um, is going to be a, a big difference maker. Um, because once you leave a platform, there's certain trust factors that are left behind. Um, but I don't listen. I I I can't speak out of turn by saying that I know what the answer is going to be. Um, yeah, it's you know, speculation at this point. <laughs> I know what I wish. I mean, what I hope is that there is a system where you can gut check any purchase outside of the system by identifying back at home base that that is real and that there's a communication like you must take this one step uh, before you uh, make any purchase, even if you see it on the most viable, trustworthy platform in the universe outside of this one, take that one step and get like a double blind confirmation, some sort of like, yep, it's real. Like, I, I mean, but again, I'm, I'm not a technology, I'm not necessarily a technology person, but all I know is that trustworthiness has to maintain at a very, very high level. Um, and coming back to the home base is a great way of, of doing that. Yeah, and I also see um, OpenSea and Vivi. Everyone's excited about going on OpenSea. I see it as apples and oranges. I see it as the platform has been built. It's a very field of dreams moment. If you build it, they will come. And it's very, very impressive. I know that the app um, is constantly being um, updated. And again, the Ecomi team is listening to their to their users, hey, tweak this. It would be great if this was organized this way, but it's really like four apps in one. And I don't know anything about app building, but it's pretty impressive that you could have a secondary market. You have a store, you have the AR, you have a social media platform, and then that you know will be welcomed into their Viviverse. So I don't fear that everyone's going to necessarily be fun to see what happens, but everyone's going to rush and put their spider bands over on open sea. That's great, but you can't do anything with it unless you bring it back into Vivi and then you can play with it. So I um, my my opinion, I'm still curious to see what happens with everybody else. I think that we're CB or BC, we're before crypto, <laughs> before the people that don't want to use their fiat, the ETH people. Um, 
but anyway, I, I know that on behalf of everybody, we could talk to you all day long. We're going to um, try to wrap it up, and I'm going to switch over to Sarah. We play a little game here at Women of VV, just a little, a little whimsy at the end uh, <laughs> to get to know you. So some rapid-fire questions. So without further ado, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, we like to have a bit of fun here. So we're just going to do a quick fire round. Um, we're going to start off with one word answers. So if you just give us an one word that comes to your mind first, if that's all right. Okay. Are we ready? <laughs> Let's yes. go. Okay, so your experience in the toy industry. Breathtaking. Nice. Your experience in the digital world. Um, revolutionary. What makes you happy? Family. Nice. How you feel about crypto? Bullish, it, <laughs> it, it, with an emphasis on ish. <laughs> um, how how would you explain VV with one word? Mind expanding. Your relationship with the Akumi team. Um, collegial. Nice. Describe NF. So, how would you describe NFTs to your customers with one word? It's a hard one. <laughs> Um, I would say expansive. Mm -hmm. um, how how you feel watching or participating in drops? I'm not sure if you participate in drops um, from other licensors on the VV app. Fair. 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 <laughs> uh, the, the future of toys and collectibles. Um, I think I, there's too many words I have on this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Just Go very you know, bright. Bright. Just bright. Very bright. Um, and your favorite collectibles? My favorite collectibles? Overall, yeah. Um, oh, you, oh, not, not <laughs> one word answer though? One Sorry. word answer? Yeah, one, one word. word. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> expensive, expensive. <laughs> expensive. Yeah. All right, we're going to move over to um, a quick fire. Would you rather? So I'm just going to give you two options, and you're only allowed to choose one. The first one that comes to your mind. Okay. Ready? <laughs> okay. Charizard or Pikachu? Pikachu. A E W or W W E? A E W. Digital toys or physical toys? Physical toys. Would you prefer to teleport or telepath? <laughs> oh, oh man! I think telepath would be really, really confusing. I have to teleport because I don't want to be inside people's brains. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, ask, ask permission or beg forgiveness. Well, it depends. In depends. business. <laughs> In business, uh, beg for forgiveness. <laughs> in personal matters, ask permission. Perfect. Uh, buy land in the Viviverse or buy more Omi? <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I just feel like the Omi bag is pretty big. So I'm going to go. Uh, I'll probably do a little bit more uh, Viviverse. Cool. Uh, flip or huddle? Uh, huddle. Pokemon NFTs or Pokemon cards? <laughs> oh, I can't go against my core. Uh, Pokemon card. You thought that might be the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Hot Wheels, Hot Wheels, or micro machines? That's so hard. I manufacture micro machines, but I played with Hot Wheels as a kid. All right, I'm gonna. Oh, I can't get in trouble with this one. Pass. <laughs> no worries. Uh, dot com or dot eth. Dot com. And I think Jennifer's got one last one for you. Oh, what were we talking about? Oh, your which is a better Crayola crayon, burnt sienna <laughs> or thistle? <laughs> thistle. Thistle. <laughs> I, I didn't even know thistle. I didn't know what thistle was. <laughs> I wouldn't know thistle if I saw a thistle. But the thistle sounds really like thistle. Almost sounds like it would get you canceled. <laughs> <laughs> you said, thistle. A thistle is and, a you know, I Scotland. <laughs> what is thistle? What is thistle? It's a flower of it's Scottish national flower. 
I wish I knew that before I said that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I, well, one thing that I don't know if everyone knows is that congratulations to you for, I guess, in May, you are now the Marvel costume partner, Marvel's costume partner with you. So I guess we wanted to know if, um, if you've decided what Ruby's going to wear for Halloween next year. <laughs> <laughs> that is so great. Um, so Ruby being uh, my little dog, uh, who's very sweet and uh, was a rescue. Um, looks, re she looks really cute in maybe like, <laughs> I don't know, probably something that is maybe, maybe, may oh God, I don't know. I, you know what? Here's the truth. The truth is, Ruby looks so cute in everything, so it's just impossible to choose something. <laughs> That's something fair. Very shiny and, and maybe with a cape. Maybe with a cape. With a cape, yes, <laughs> exact, exactly, yes. A cape would be perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much again for having this time with us today. We've had a great time. Thank you, ladies. Wonderful questions, and yeah. I hope that y'all had a fun time out there, team mm -hmm. and and Ikomi family and our VV family. Is there anything else you want to brag about, show off, or yeah. tell us? I no, I just, I, so I'll, I'll say a couple things. First of all, just from an interviewing standpoint, um, this has been maybe one of the most absolutely inter, uh, enjoyable uh, inter interactions in my, in my career. Like, you know, you, you, y'all spent so much time um, really trying to understand, you know, who I am. Um, and I do deeply appreciate that. It, you went so far above and beyond um, I, uh, I just, you know, I just want you to know from that. It means a lot to me and it really, you know, for me, it's also affirming because it means that I, you know, I tried to be known for something that was positive. So the fact that you, you know, took the time really means a lot. And the second thing that I would say is that, you know, when you, when you kind of, when you co-own a, a big company or something, um, you, you have a choice to sort of like not be in the public eye or be in the public eye. And for me, I just want people to know that like I paid for school. Like I, I grew up in small Southern towns. Um, I didn't necessarily have any connections at all. Um, I did have a scenario where my parents and specifically my mom was very loving. My dad was very hardworking. And so I saw a lot of that nurturing uh, in different ways, but anybody can be the next person that owns the next big thing. Um, there are few barriers today to in information, fewer barriers to information today than there's than there have been in the past. And it just I, I hope that uh, that the next leadership and digital and physical um, assets uh, come from men and women um, who are highly engaged and highly hardworking people. Um, and you, y'all just blew me away today. Um, so thank you for that. And then, you know, finally, um, I would just like to say that, um, I'm going to continue to be part of the community and a collector and that I do appreciate, you know, uh, you know, people that, that do like reach out and follow, you know, me or, or anything that I'm working on or, or the company that, that I'm part of, um, whether it's professional or personal. And, uh, and, you know, thank you very much. Thank you for that. It's been our pleasure. It's been our pleasure. And thank you. What a wonderful compliment to have. Huge, huge. Love. You guys are awesome. Thank have you. a wonderful, wonderful day. And I guess that's the sign off. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.